but now he lives. See him coming on the clouds of heaven. Every eye behold him now. He's the living one, the first and the last who once was dead, but now he lives forever and ever. Well, good morning and good evening, church. It is a blessing to be able to open God's Word again. Uh, we're continuing our 12-week series on Christmas, uh, the pr- and today we'll be looking at Genesis chapter 3, verse 1 to 19, the promised seed of Christmas. If this is your first time, we welcome you. My name is Andrew. I'm the minister at St. Stephen's Flemington, and you can get connected to our church with the links down below. You'll see our Facebook, our website, an email and a phone number for you to contact. Uh, I do invite you to open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 3, verse 1 to 19. If you don't have your Bible in front of you, pause the video, grab your Bible, and resume the video. And if you don't have a Bible uh, for yourself, uh, please let me know. I'd love to give you one uh, as a gift uh, for you to keep. Genesis chapter 3, verse 1 to 19. This is God's Word. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the women, Did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, She took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid. Because I was naked, and I hid myself. He said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman whom you gave to me be with me, she gave me the fruit of the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. Verse 14, The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat, all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. To the woman he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, and he shall rule over you. And to Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife, and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring th- forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, on the, of your face, you shall eat bread. Till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Amen. That was God's word. Let us pray. Our God, our Father, we give you thanks for your word. We're thankful that your word uh, teaches us, and encourages us, and challenges us. Father, we ask that your spirit would be blessing us uh, this, uh, today as we uh, think about your word and hear your word preached. We pray that you would transform our lives and challenge us in our faith. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, Genesis chapter 3, verse 1 to 19, the promised seed of Christmas. Have you ever wondered why there is suffering and pain in this world? Have you ever wondered if there is sure hope? Well, you see, the Bible gives an answer to why there is suffering and pain in this world. And it also gives us an answer to the solution to the pain and the suffering of this world. And it isn't what the world would say. 
the solution to the pains and suffering of this world, the solution to this evil in this world, is partially in the story of Christmas. It's about Christmas. How does evil, suffering, and pain relate to Christmas? I'm on a Christmas high. A time which is supposed to be full of joy, presents, and gatherings. How does the fall of Adam and Eve relate to Christmas? Well, we need Christmas because of the fall. And Christmas is foreshadowed in the fall. And there's so much to say about Genesis chapter 3. Uh, that we're going to be actually looking at part of it today. And we'll pick up some of the themes next week. Uh, when we look at Romans chapter 5. So this is kind of like a two-part sermon uh, for the sake of time. We're going to be looking at an overview of Genesis chapter 3, an overview, so it's not, you know, uh, we're not going to look at everything, just an overview, and we're going to trace the theme of the promise seed today. And then next week, when we look at Romans 5, we'll look at Jesus, the second Adam. Um, um, our main passage or our main verse for today will be in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, uh, but we'll look at some of the other things that pop out. So we're going to look at an overview, then we're going to look at the promised seed, and we're going to conclude with some thoughts. I want you to notice uh, today the direction of human history, though, right? Uh, the tragedy and the importance of Genesis chapter 3. Uh, do you remember what we looked at last week? Christmas and creation, Genesis chapter 1. And Genesis chapter 1, we saw in the beginning was God, the eternal, self-sufficient God. We see that the Bible introduces us to the power of God, His creating power, how He created everything, something out of nothing. No one can do that. And do you remember how He created creation? He created it good. He created it good. In fact, when He made man and woman, he made it very good. And if you remember, John Calvin said, the whole world is a theater for the display of the divine goodness, wisdom, justice, and power. This universe is a theater to put God's glory on display. It's about God and His beauty and His majesty. It's about His holiness, His power, His justice, His wisdom. And God made humans very special to reflect who He is. He made them in His likeness. He made them in the image of God. And we're skipping chapter 2, but in chapter 2, uh, Genesis zooms in into creation, doesn't it? If you know your Bibles a little bit, God created the Garden of Eden and placed Adam and Eve in the garden to tend it, to work it, to look after it. They were in paradise. And so far, so good in the first two chapters of the Bible. Everything is rainbows and roses. Adam and Eve were in fellowship with God, the Creator, and they were enjoying His creation, His good creation. We like Genesis chapter 1 and 2. And they were able to eat everything in the garden except the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You would hope that Adam and Eve would be obedient and find joy and satisfaction in God. You would hope that they would. But we look around the world, just look around you. And we quickly find that the world is not like the Garden of Eden. If all was once good, what happened? What happened? Why do we experience relational disconnect from God? Why do we find brokenness in this world? Uh, why do we have brokenness between other people and ourselves? Why is there pain and suffering in this world? Why is there evil? In this world. Well, we enter chapter 3. We enter chapter 3, our passage today. It begins with an ominous verse. Open your Bibles to chapter 3, verse 1. Now the, now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field, and the Lord God, that the Lord God had made. An ominous verse. We're introduced to trouble. We're introduced to the chief enemy of the Lord and his people. The serpent whose work of temptation brought ruin to the life of Eden. Satan. Serpent is the manifestation of Satan and he tempts God's people. So what happens in this passage? 
as we skim through this passage, I want you to notice four movements. We're going to skim through it. We're going to see four movements. The first movement you're going to see is in verses 1 to 5. We have the temptation of Satan. Satan questions God and puts doubt in Eve's mind. He gets Eve to question God's goodness, doesn't he? He questions God. In fact, he goes so far to completely reject God's words. He rejects God's word completely. He dismisses God's word. Look at verse 4. Verse 4, But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. He completely rejects what God says. In fact, uh, what he does is he puts his words, Satan's words, above God's word. He's telling Eve to believe in his words instead of God's word. And Satan does exactly that today, doesn't he? He tells us that the sinful things of this world are okay. He tells us that the sinful desires that we have are all right. It won't harm anyone. It's all right. It's okay. No one will know. He says that his ways are better than God's ways. Oh, how foolish are we to believe him? How often do we fall in the traps of Satan? Just like in the Garden of Eden. He tells Adam and Eve they are missing out. They could be God. They could have complete autonomy. And Satan often tells us that we're missing out. When in fact, we're not. Paul puts it this way in Romans chapter 125. Because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator. They and we and the rest of the world exchanged the truth, exchanged the truths of God for the lies of Satan and the world. So that's the first movement in verses 1 to 5, the temptation of Satan. The second movement we see is in verse 67. We have the fall of humanity. Verse 6, look at it with me. Satan tempts her. Then it says in verse 6, So when the woman saw that the tree was good for evil and that it was a delight to the eyes, and the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some of her husband who was with her, and he ate. She ate it and Adam ate it. Notice Adam was there from the very beginning. He was there the whole time. He was with her. He should have done something at the he- as the head of the family. He should have stopped her. He should have defended God's honor and glory. But he too ate and disobeyed God. At the core of the fall is disobedience to God, the creator. At the core of the fall is not trusting God. Even though they had everything they needed, even though they saw God's goodness and grace, they rejected God. They committed high treason against God. And every time we sin, we don't trust God. We doubt God's goodness and grace. We commit high treason when we sin. And nearly we see their shamefulness. Look at verse 7. That the eyes of them were both, when the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin cloths. The fall of humanity, doubting God's goodness and grace, being disobedient to God the Creator, high treason against God. That's the second movement. The third movement is the confrontation. Look at verse 8 to 13. 8 to 13, the confrontation. God confronts Adam and Eve. Verse 8. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. They thought they could hide from the all-knowing, all-powerful creator God. And God confronts them. And sadly, instead of uh, sadly, in this confrontation, instead of recognizing their sinfulness and their mistake, they play the bl- blame game, don't they? They play the blame game. Adam blamed woman. Woman blamed serpent. It was no one's fault. Maybe you think today that sounds like you. That's what sin does. We play the blame game. In the confrontation, God confronts them. And they don't recognize their sinfulness. They play the blame game. 
and they try to avoid the consequence. But what happens? What happens when the holy creator God meets sinful creation? Finally, in this passage, we see the fourth movement, God's response, his judgment in verses 14 to 19. We see the curse that the Lord delivers. He speaks first to the serpent, then to Eve, and finally with Adam. The peak of judgment is with Adam because Adam's account because of Adam was accountable as the head of the human race. Why is the world the way it is? Why is the evil and suffering in this world? Because sin entered through the world through the disobedience of the fall. Because of Adam as the head of the human race. In Romans 5, 12 puts it this way. We're going to look at it a bit more detail next week. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, so death spread to all men. Why? Because all have sinned. We'll look at Romans 5 more next week. You see, Genesis 3 sets the tension of the whole book of the Bible, the whole story of the Bible. How are things, at this point in time, how are things going to go back to the Garden of Eden? Well, how are things going to be better than the Garden of Eden? At the fall, there is a change, a reversal. All good to conflict, to pain, to enmity, to suffering. How are the curses going to be reversed, to be resolved? How are things going, going to be? How are things going to go back to normal in one sense? That's the overview of Genesis chapter 3. But in the midst of the temptation, the fall, the confrontation, and the judgment, there is a promise. Even though God banished him and cursed him, he also gave them a promise. God gave Adam and Eve the promise of a seed, a seed who would be born of woman. That seed would make all that was wrong right. He would make this broken world, this whole world, right again. This seed would bring peace and harmony in a world which is full of pain and suffering, turmoil, conflict, and evil. God promises that the seed would overcome the serpent, securing the final victory and ushering in the wave um, of peace and victory. And the key verse is in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. There's a promise. In the midst of the temptation, the fall, the confrontation, the judgment, there is hope. There is hope. There's a promise. Who will overcome the world's problem? Who will redeem the fall? Who will fix the curse of humanity and this world? It isn't you. It isn't me. It isn't human society. It isn't world peace. And you know, sometimes we read the Bible and we think the story is all about me. Indeed, we as humans play a role in history, but we're just extras in the theater of God's glory. Notice at the beginning of verse 15, who will do it? I will. Verse 15, it is God who will do something about it. It is God who initiates. It is God who saves. Satan has announced war against God. He has deceived Adam and Eve. He has put down God's word. And God announces that he will defeat him. Notice, you know, verse, the verses 14 and 15 is to Satan. The curse is to Satan. And the promise is to Satan and to all of humanity. God announces that he will defeat Satan, to defeat him, and he will bring hope. And how will he do it? It will be from the seed of women the offspring of women. And notice if you look at it, it is he, verse 15, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. We're looking for the he of Genesis 3.15. We're looking for the seed of Genesis 3.15, the seed. It will, and it won't be without struggle. Although the seed will defeat Satan, there will be affliction in this battle. Suffering plays a part in this battle. 
throughout the Old Testament, we're waiting for the seed, the one who will save. When we read the Old Testament, we are tracing the story of the seed. But unfortunately, every time we meet a potential candidate, we can quickly find out that it's not him, either because he gets killed off or because we find out that he's imperfect. And the series of Christmas, we'll see a bit more of it. We'll see quite a few um, stories of how it relates to Jesus and his coming. If you remember from two weeks ago, we looked at Galatians chapter 4, verse 4 to 7. Do you remember verse 4? When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of what? Born of woman. In the fullness of time, in God's perfect timing, God promised the promised seed. God delivered the promised seed of Christmas. Christmas is the fulfillment of Genesis 3.15. You can't get Christmas. You can't get salvation until you understand the tragedy of Genesis 3. You can't understand why we need a savior unless you get the temptation, the fall, the confrontation, and the curse, and the judgment. Because Jesus comes Jesus came to reverse the effects of the fall. He came to redeem the fall. He came to bring the better Garden of Eden in him. And the great thing about Genesis 3.15 is that it is a message of hope. A hope, a hope in a world full of pain and suffering. It is a message of hope in a world full of conflict and evil. God has promised and declared the final victory in the seed, in Jesus Christ. In Jesus Christ, the whole world is redeemed through Him. In Jesus Christ, we are redeemed to the Father and we are able to have fellowship with Him by grace alone, through faith alone. By grace alone, through faith alone, we can be reconciled to the Father. You see, Christmas is about the promised seed of Genesis 3. The Bible is about the promised seed of Genesis 3, where Jesus will come, He will live the perfect life. He will die on the cross for sinful men. But he will rise again. And so he will get afflicted. I mean, he's a suffering servant king. We've been looking at it in the Gospel of Mark. Christmas is about the promised seed of Genesis 3 in Jesus Christ. So why did Jesus come to this world? Why do we have Christmas? To reverse the effects of the fall. To reverse it and to destroy the works of the evil one, to destroy the works of the devil, to defeat, to defeat sin and death, to bring, his, to bring his people to himself. He came to set the captives free. In Christmas, he came to set the captives free. He came to establish his kingdom, authority and rule, and to put down his enemies. He's the king of kings and the lord of lords. By grace through faith in Christ alone, we join the victory as we wait for our king to return. We are at war with the devil. We're in a spiritual war. Do you know that? That you are in spiritual warfare? The Bible makes it very clear, especially in Ephesians. We need to put on the whole armor of God. We are in a spiritual battle and we need to be spiritually equipped, trusting God and relying on Him day by day. Because I can assure you, if you're not equipped, Satan will come to kill, steal and destroy. But know for sure, even when life comes crushing down, even when the greatest pains and sufferings of this world come about, even when people betray you, persecute you, hate on you um, and say, bad things and do bad things to you, God has promised a seed. The seed has come in Jesus Christ and Christ has already defeated sin and death on the cross and through his resurrection. And he will come again to bring his people to glory. You can know for sure because of Christmas, the promise has come. As we finish thinking about the promised seed of Christmas, Let me give you some last thoughts about this passage. As we read scripture, especially as we read through the Old Testament and New Testament, let us read it in the lens of Christ as the main character, the main person in the story. We live in an individualistic world. 
And the temptation is to read ourselves into the story when it's often not about us. Let's read the Old Testament, anticipating the coming of Jesus. And it will make more sense. The narrative will make more sense when you trace the offsprings and the seeds and look forward to the second coming of Jesus as you read the New Testament. And finally, as we come closer to Christmas, let's rejoice and give thanks to God. Give thanks to Him because at Christmas 2,000 years ago, God finally sent the seed to come to this world to reverse the effects of the fall. You can be assured that the brokenness of this world, the effects of the fall will not last. You can be sure that this world will not last. The pains and sufferings of this world will not last. You can have certainty in life, and you can have certainty in death of the great hope that there is in Jesus Christ because of the great hope in Jesus Christ. Especially in the midst of the coronavirus pandemic, you can know for sure even the pandemic cannot take away the great hope that there is in Jesus. The great hope that there is in the promised seed. Jesus Christ was not an afterthought. Christmas was not an afterthought. Jesus Christ is the promised seed of Christmas. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we're thankful for your word. It saddens us every time we read Genesis 3 to 4, the tragedy that occurred there. But we're thankful to you because by your grace, by your goodness and your love for us, you promised a seed who will defeat sin and death, who will reverse the effects of the fall, and who will bring salvation to your people. Father, we're thankful for Christmas, the coming of your Son, who came to reverse the effects of the, the, of the fall, who came as the promised seed of woman to save us. And so, Father, we ask that you would help us to grow in our love for you and to rejoice and find joy in you. Help us to hold fast to the fact that there is great hope in you, even in the midst of suffering and pain, even in the world full of evil and temptation. Father, help us to hold fast to you and help us to put the full armor of God as we battle this spiritual warfare. Father, as we come to your word every day, help us to read it in light of Christ. Help us to trace Christ and help us to learn more about him. We ask that you would encourage us and challenge us, especially during this season, and help us to grow in our love and joy for you. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Christ alone.